So good evening and welcome uh, to this last in Hillary term of the Humane Philosophy Project Ian Ramsey Centre seminars, which this year have been uh, focused around the theme of naturalism. Uh, and uh, this evening uh, our speaker is uh, Professor Mieszko Tawasiewicz, who is currently the director of the Institute of Philosophy at the University of Warsaw. Uh, he uh, teaches in the Department of uh, Logical Semiotics, um, uh, he's also been the editor-in-chief of Philosophia Nauki, the philosophy of science, quarterly for almost um, 15 years. And his interests include uh, philosophy of language, philosophy of science, semiotics, uh, and philosophy of religion as well, which is a very interesting and explosive uh, mix. Um, and uh, today he's going to talk to us uh, uh, about the connection between images uh, in science uh, and religion, uh, and how they relate to the issues connected to naturalism. So please give a very warm welcome to Professor Mishka Tawakiri. Thank you. In fact, I'm going to talk about rather disconnection of this, those images. The title of my talk is too narrow, I think. Uh, the, analysis of mental images, be they of pictorial or more conceptual character evoked by certain scientific or religious considerations would serve just an illustration or a case study for the purpose of discussion of something more general and more deeper, uh, namely the relation of reason and faith in general. There is a grand tradition to discuss this topic here in Oxford. Uh, let me mention just one prominent example of it, that is course, Oxford University Sermons by Cardinal John Henry Newman, uh, given some 18 decades ago. In fact, I agree with Newman in many respects, so that my talk could perhaps be regarded as a kind of a supplement to the sermon, or even get an air of a sermon itself. Uh, well, it is a common background in contemporary discussions that faith is a certain belief about the universe. Theist and Atheists such as Alistair McGrath on one side and Richard Dawkins on the other would share the, this background, diverging in their judgment about whether this belief is held according to sufficient evidence given by reason or rather without such evidence or even against substantial evidence to the contrary. McGrath would proceed to say that, quote, this is a matter of intellectual integrity in which all sides whether atheist, theist, or Christian, seek to offer the best explanation of the available evidence. This is basic philosophy of science, end of quote. The point of my view is that theism, as well as atheism, cannot be regarded as the best explanation of the available evidence, if the evidence is understood as anything close to what basic philosophy of science would consider as evidence. As a matter of fact, it cannot be regarded as any sort of evidence, better or worse, because there is no required connection between natural phenomena that could serve the purpose of evidence and the principles of faith. Not only logical connections are missing, but any relevant connections whatsoever. For while it is widely accepted that there is no logical proof or disproof of the thesis about the existence of God on the grounds of natural science, the view that natural phenomena would, in some indirect way, weaker than logical, but nevertheless quite strong, speak for or against this thesis is still quite popular. But it is not true, or so I would argue. The notion of explanation of facts by theories in philosophy of science is grounded in a certain kind of connection of a uh, logical or at least probabilistic one between theories and facts. Theories predict some states of affairs, and if these states are facts, the theories get corroborated, as Popper would say. Uh, if the states turn out to be counterfactual, the theories get falsified. Empirical underdetermination under of theories, to which McGrath alludes, means that different theories might be connected to the same known facts and be therefore equally corroborated by them. The scientists may take sides on the grounds of their expectations as to which of the competing theories are more likely to gain new evidence 
in the future, but they usually agree on which of the known facts speak for and which speak against the theories in question. It is not so, and it is dramatically not so in the case of theism. Science does not decide the problem of theism, not because the body of natural evidence is in a sort of an equilibrium between pros and cons, in the sense that some facts speak for, some other facts speak against the probability of the existence of God, and they are pretty much balanced. Science cannot decide this problem because no single natural fact can be considered as corroborating or falsifying theism. People often think that this or that phenomenon would support or undermine faith, but what is really brought to clash belong, belongs rather to the realm of some particular imagery evoked by science and religion than to actual content of faith or scientific theories. It is very striking that both sides would often point to the very same facts in order to account for or respectively against these. And I will give five illustrations of this. Two of them are traditional in this debate and perhaps all that can be said about them already has been said. So I will only recall them briefly. But the next three are more recent and I will pay a bit closer attention to them. The first is of course the Copernican revolution as discussed, for instance, by Bertrand Russell in his Religion and Science. While Russell himself soberly admits that, quote, there is nothing in the Copernican astronomy to prove that we are less important than we naturally suppose ourselves to be, end of quote, it has become a cliché that Copernican astronomy suggests unimportance of man in the universe. Quote again, while... It was thought that the sun and moon, the planets and the fixed stars revolved once a day about the earth. It was easy to suppose that they existed for our benefit and that we were of special interest to the creator. But when Copernicus and his successors persuaded the world that it is we who rotate while the stars take no notice of our earth, when it appeared further that our earth is small compared to the several of the planets, and that they are small compared to the sun. When calculation and the telescope revealed the vastness of the solar system, of our galaxy, and finally of the universe of innumerable galaxies, it became increasingly difficult to believe that such a remote and parochial retreat could have the importance to be expected of the home of man, if man had the cosmic significance assigned to him in traditional theology." End of quote. So the image of our insignificance, of our contingency as part of the physical universe in the eyes of many people would suggest that God does not exist. Other people, however, would reply that it is exactly our contingency that suggests the existence of God. For we need to take into consideration how unique is the earth with, it, with its abundant and complicated forms of life compared to the sterile emptiness of the observable part of the universe. Only some blind cosmic necessity, they say, could replace God as an explanation of that fact, while cosmic contingency cannot be comprehended without God, who is able to impose such unique features on such a remote and parochial planet as the Earth. We have the same fact, so much different imaterial interpretations. The other illustration of the first two is biological evolution, of course. Atheists would say that it is unintelligible why good and almighty God could possibly have chosen such a way of creation, full of pain, of fear, of imperfections. This image can be countered, though. I will leave aside the observation that pain or fear are, in fact, positive adaptations, that an animal feeling no fear and no pain would be a dead animal. The inability to feel pain is a serious disease, not an advantage. I will leave aside to the observation that according to the revelation, the earth is far from being the kingdom of heaven and that the title of the prince of this world is not exactly an honorable one. We shouldn't expect any sort of perfection here on earth. The earth is heading to its end in rather apocalyptic circumstances. God offers us salvation, not abolition of natural difficulties. So the main counter image, however, is the following. 
Evolution namely offers an intuitive for some people solution to a problem raised among others by Jean Paul Sartre. How could God, whose will governs all existence, have created a being who is able to act according to his or her own will? How could God ask for human obedience and love as a free gift that man can give or refuse to give to his creator? This question resembles a medieval paradox of omnipotence. Can God create a stone so heavy that he cannot lift it? Well, the substantial difference is that God evidently wanted to make man so free that he couldn't force him to obey. Considering of this purely theological question strongly suggests that in the act of creation, God must have placed some kind of screen between man and himself, that he must have grounded man's personality in some axiologically neutral medium which exceeds man's ability to comprehend. The world, the world of nature with its rich structure and lack of values which provides a setting for the evolution of man as an animal is an ideal answer to this purely theological question. Evolution as a means of creation of a highly complex material world needs not be an unsolved puzzle, a God's whim, but can be taken as the basis of man's independent existence and his free will. And evolution here must be understood in a very strict sense as something preventing us from seeing God's actions. The intelligent project attempting to show, to show God's industry in the machinery of natural world, apart from its hopelessness as a scientific theory, simply won't do in this theological role. Again, the same bunch of facts, so different images involved. In the cases of Copernican or Darwinian revolutions in scientific picture of the world, this immaterial character of conflict between science and religion has already been well acknowledged. Yet the distrusts felt towards scientific discoveries did not disappear from theology. Or the crusade against religious beliefs did not disappear from the agenda of many scientists either. We regularly witness scientists advertising their research as undermining the claims of religion, as well as theologians condemning new discoveries of science. Let us, let us consider three cases which have been in the focus of debate in the last few years. A good case to start with is the discovery, of, alleged discovery made by Dean Hamer of uh, genetic predisposition towards religion, the so-called God gene. Hamer postulates that there is a correlation between a certain form of gene, VMAT2, and susceptibility to religious, religious belief, <coughs> measured by the subject's openness to belief things not literally provable. Hamer also identifies an ecological mechanism responsible for the transmission of uh, the religion prone allele. The carriers of this allele, thanks to the increased production of neurotransmitters encoded by it, have a more genial personality and are more optimistic, which in turn leads to their having a larger number of children. Hamer's work has run into serious criticism from other scientists, and it is unclear whether the mechanism described by this author really exists. And I'm not going to debate this issue here. The very idea itself that the predisposition towards religious belief, towards what's invisible, varies in degree, and that the variability is somehow congenitally determined, does not seem absurd to me. On the contrary, it accords with evolutionary intuitions of many people, including myself, and I think it's quite credible. Perhaps the genetic background of such a trait is more complex than simply the mutation within one gene. The ecological mechanism of uh, selection involved here may well be different too, but the very idea sounds plausible. Nevertheless, it has attracted a strong opposition from many theologians, including Reverend John Polkinghorne, who in response to some interview questions <coughs> said that, quote, the idea of a God gene goes against all my personal theological convictions. The force of such reactions betrays a conviction that there is something 
thoroughly ungodly in accepting that some people are naturally more predisposed to believe in God than others. Everybody is the same distance from God, they say. I find this opposition baffling. The claim that everyone is the same distance from God is, to my way of thinking, patently false. Some people live in peaceful time, others during a war. Some have able bodies, others are disabled. Some are brought up in a religious environment, others not. In a word, some are a short distance from God, others far away. God's justice does not consist in everyone being the same short distance from him, but in God's knowing the different distances and always meeting us at the right spot. With some, he need only take a step forward to meet them. With others, he will have to carry them off. Jesus approached St. Peter and said, come with me, and St. Peter followed him. Doubting Thomas, the apostle, would not be satisfied until Jesus showed him his hands and sighed. St. Paul had to be struck blind in the desert before he could see the truth. It wouldn't be far-fetched to refer to the corresponding genetic profiles as Peter's profile and Thomas' profile, effectively, or Paul's profile. Thus, regardless of whether Hamer's work is indeed a scientific achievement or not, his hypothesis at least could be true. It does not go against a real content of religious beliefs. It doesn't speak for them, but it doesn't speak against them either. Another example is furnished by the still hotly debated discoveries of Benjamin Liebert from 1970s and 1980s. His subjects were asked to press a buzzer at the point of their choosing and to remember the position of the experimental clock at the time they made the decision to press the buzzer. At the same time, the subjects were undergoing an EEG test. Libet demonstrated that the so-called readiness potential in the part of the brain controlling motor functions preceded by about 500 milliseconds the point which the subjects indicated as the time at which they had made the decision. Many commentators and followers, including, for example, Daniel Wegner, hold that the research suggests that the sense of agency is an illusion and that man has no free will after all. It is not hard to guess that for this reason, theologians have treated those findings as highly suspect. I think that those findings, as any findings, should have been treated with suspicion by science itself. William Clem identifies a number of intra-scientific reasons why Libet's findings should be treated with a great deal of skepticism. Let us suppose, however, that further research clears up such doubts and finds that man has no conscious control over his spontaneous pressing of a button, that an impulse is generated in the brain randomly, while consciousness creates the illusion of a free decision only ex post facto. Again, such findings would contain nothing that the church or moralists, including secular moralists, have not been proclaiming all along. Let me quote from John Paul II's letter to the youth of the world. To be truly free does not at all mean doing everything that pleases me or doing what I want to do. To be truly free means to use one's own freedom for what is a true good. And uh, in Catechism of the Catholic Church, we read, man's dignity therefore requires him to act out of conscious and free choice, not by blind impulses in himself or by mere external constraint. In short, we need to distinguish will from wish. A situation where in a certain interval I'm to press a button is not a paradigmatic example of free will, but an example of following blind impulses. It is precisely a paradigmatic example of giving in to the illusion of free will. When I do what I wish, I'm not truly free. I'm a slave to my desires. I am free only when I do what I ought to do. According to the so-called free thinkers, Christianity stands for enslavement, a set of prohibitions, injunctions, and restrictions. Where is the freedom, they ask. They rebel against religion by invoking freedom to follow one's wishes. 
Meanwhile, the moralists say that the cases of following one's wishes are the cases where it may at most seem to us that we are making a decision. But in fact, we are being driven by desires or by, by some random blind impulses. The message that follows from Libet studies fits, fits in uh, with the age-old moral teachings. If we want to demonstrate our free will, we should not fall back on a feeling that attaches itself to some ad hoc decisions. The only way in which free will, and hence true freedom, manifests itself is in our making a prior decision sufficiently far in advance about what we are going to do at a given point in time. If we have free will, we will work through an arbitrary order. This is besides the idea behind liturgical Lent calendar. The Lent calendar aims to impose an arbitrary pattern on our decisions. We are required to decide at certain points in time to refrain from eating. Uh, this is always technically doable, uh, which can't be said about an actual decision to eat something. Yet by refraining, we hold off a powerful desire. And to this extent, success is a good measure of our being able to fulfill our freedom. Libet's research is thought to put a question mark over free will only because the image of freedom has been distorted. It is said now, for instance, uh, Seth Floyd would say something like this, that we are free when we do not know what we are about to do, although this can be known to a researcher examining our brain waves. However, true free will is precisely the opposite. When I follow my will, I know what I'm going to do, not in 500 milliseconds, but in five months, something that researcher looking into my brain doesn't know. It is this understanding of free will that finds expression in our language. We say that someone has a strong will, not when they are actively pursuing their desires, but when they are able to resist them. And my last example is the question of the existence of an innate moral sense, an area studied by Mark Hauser in Harvard. Although in this case too, the methodology of the research fell victim to some recent accusations of scientific misconduct, I'm apt to ignore the intra-scientific worries and assume that we are justified in claiming that humans possess a universal moral sense, which has evolved over time and thanks to which we feel doing personally physical harm to another person as evil. Historically, theologians have come down on both sides of the question. On the one hand, they feel vindicated. It is the atheists who used to say of morality as being a fancy notion, dreamed up by humans, as something relative with respect to culture. While theologians have argued that conscience the ability to distinguish between good and evil is an innate disposition, a responsiveness to the universal natural law. On the other hand, provision of universal morality used to be held solely within the domain of religion, and the discovery of a biological moral sense strikes at the heart of this claim. In fact, as with the examples discussed earlier, scientific discoveries are fully in line with the age-old moral knowledge. Humans have an innate moral sense, which gives them the notion of good and evil as distinct from profitable, unprofitable, pleasant, unpleasant, and so on. At the same time, innate moral sense is far not enough to produce a fully developed morality. You have heard that it had been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans do the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans do so? Jesus' teaching do not, does not invo invoke natural law. On the contrary, it is explicitly explicitly opposed to natural law. It is natural to love our friends, but Jesus 
wants us to love our enemies as well. It is natural to reciprocate kindness with kindness, but Jesus has us reciprocate evil with good. It is natural to pay for the work done, but Jesus proposed to pay the same wages to a worker who has worked barely an hour as to the one who has worked the whole day. Anyone today who thinks it is natural should try to arrange a similar paying arrangement with his workers. Natural moral sense is necessary for the understanding of morality, for the ability to have the concept of good and evil, but it is not itself a morality. So what's so disturbing in the Harvard moral test? Summing up, these illustrations were supposed to show that no scientific discoveries are ever likely to pose a threat to theism, not to any particular version of it. On the other hand, no scientific discovery will ever be likely to provide evidence for theism, to say nothing of the revealed faith. As Cardinal Newman would put it, it is indeed a great question whether atheism is not as philosophically consistent with the phenomena of the physical world taken by themselves as the doctrine of a creative and governing power. End of quote. We cannot seek in science a reason for believing if we don't want to find a, a reason for not believing. It is a psychologically proven fact that people think of rejecting some evidence in favor of a theory as of proving the negation of this theory. This is a logical fallacy, of course, yet still a very common one. People are fond of using this mechanism against their opponents. They show, for instance, without much difficulty, weaknesses in pseudoscientific apologias, such as intelligent intelligent project, and announce triumphantly that they have proven religion to be false. And people believe them. Let me quote Cardinal Newman again. From a wish to make religion acceptable to the world in general, we betray it to its enemies. This way we have approached, from a certain angle, the problem of the rationality of faith. Is, in the light what I have said, faith irrational? Doesn't all this lead inevitably to agnosticism as the only rational view? What about the old figures of fides querens intellectum and intellectus querens fidem? First of all, we must say this. Faith is not theism. It is not a belief at all. Not in the first place. Of course, there are beliefs that follow from faith. And the belief that there is God, of course, is not the least one among them. But at the core of the matter, faith isn't a belief. Another quotation, while the intellect is not to be neglected, faith is very much, very much more than knowledge. It is not mere belief in a thought or conception or idea. It is the expression of the whole nature of man in response to God's approach in Christ. From William Griffith Thomas, The Principles of Theology. Faith is a grace of God and a virtue of man. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church would put it, believing is an act of assenting to the divine truth by command of the will moved by God through grace. And proceed, before this faith can be, before this faith can be exercised, man must have the grace of God to move and assist him. He must have the interior helps of the Holy Spirit who moves the heart and converts it to God. No theologian, no philosopher, and the last a scientist could claim they have resources to persuade anyone to believe. We are not the Holy Ghost. It is as absurd to argue men as to torture them into believing. Another famous quotation from Cardinal Newman. We must not forget, as we often do, that faith is not a relation between a man and a proposition, but then Relation, but the relation between a man and God, this is not a propositional attitude, it is interpersonal relation. And once we saw that faith in its beginnings is an act rather than anything else, we can see that agnosticism is not an option. We can refrain ourselves from holding a belief and from holding its negation at the same time. We can assert none of them. But we cannot refrain 
from doing something and from not doing it in the same time. Either we do or we don't. According to faith, we cannot be agnostic. We have to choose. Of course, there is a kind of mental state, perhaps identified by empirical psychology, of being uncertain what to do, of making decision. Decision-making is a process, not a point in time, but it is far from any sort of a stable and safe position, comfortable to be occupied for the whole life. It is rather a difficult, unstable position such that we would like to change it as soon as possible. We cannot keep saying for years that we haven't decided yet. If we don't believe, we don't believe. Decision is made, whatever are the declarations. Let us now reconsider the notion of rationality of faith. The point is that there are completely different notions of rationality. The one that is applicable to beliefs or propositions and the one applicable to decisions. If the reasons to hold a belief are in balance with reasons to reject it, it is rational to refrain from judgment. However, if there is a decision to be made, an act to perform, we cannot assume that the rational decision is a priori to pick the negatively characterized option, that not to believe is somehow more rational than to believe. The formula intellectus querens fidem stays for precisely this, the eradication of anti-religious superstitions, realizing that we have equal intellectual right to believe as not to believe. As Cardinal Newman noticed, so numerous and so serious have been the errors of theorists on religious subjects that the correction of those errors has required the most vigorous and subtle exercise of the reason. End of quote. So these are the preambula fidei, clearing, clearing a path. And when we clear the path, the Holy Spirit shall approach us. And then the whole thing starts to make sense in a completely different way. On assumption of faith, in the light of faith, the world might indeed picture itself as a divine beauty. Another quotation, it is antecedent probability that gives meaning to those arguments from facts, which are commonly called the evidences of revelation. And where Newman says in this quotation, antecedent probability, I would rather have antecedent act of faith. Of course, on assumption of atheism, the picture would be quite different. But what is important is that it is the antecedent act what determines the picture. And we shall not allow the picture to determine the act. The picture has no such legitimate powers. I'm heading to the end, but for a sort of an addendum to the talk, let me briefly relate what I have said so far to the notion of science and religion as the so-called non-overlapping magisteria. I think this is again a wrong picture. In fact, there is rather a full inclusion of one within the other. The question is which one in which one. I think that from the atheist point of view, religion, or better to say theology, is a part of science. For in this perspective, it has essentially no subject matter. It is useful insofar as it provides some insight into the sociology or history of religious beliefs, uh, which makes it a proper part of sociology or history in general. On the assumption of faith, on the other hand, it is science, all science in fact, that is contained in a broadly understood theology. This claim takes its apparently radical air from the common view that science and religion are concerned with different ontological orders, the natural and the supernatural. From the Christian point of view, however, there is no question of there being any different orders. There's one order. God made heaven and earth, including all things on earth and all the laws which govern them. Nature and non-nature can only be distinguished epistemologically. Nature is what we can know by scientific methods. Science, the scientific method, is needed here for the definition of the term nature. The ontological distinction between nature and non-nature is possible only on the grounds of some gnostic heresy. 
as a when you can claim that the spirit comes from God, while nature is that which comes from the demon. A Christian cannot accept this view. To him, everything that exists except God himself has the same origin. Natural sciences like physics or biology are all studies of certain God's works. Revelation tells us of the meaning of human life, of the task God gave to man, of how to act and what to as true. It also says that the world was created by God. It does not explain, however, how the world was created and what mechanism God furnished it with. If we so wish, we can seek such explanations by the natural light of reason, where the word natural is relatively innocent here. We might rephrase it as uh, by sole intellectual power without the aid of revelation. And we do. We have developed sophisticated scientific methods and made a number of important discoveries which reveal to us how the world works. The scientific methods of studying the world are the products are the product of our efforts. That makes them natural. They are invented, not revealed. And the proposition that the world was created by God, or that it wasn't, doesn't change anything here. Science about the world created by God is empirically undistinguishable from science about a world which has sprung up from nothing by accident. That's why a theist, as well as an atheist, can and shall keep to the stance of the so-called methodological naturalism. No revealed truths are allowed in scientific explanation. Natural science, even as a part of theology, is by definition about what we can know without the aid of revelation. Every scientist, a Christian and an atheist alike, is, an, is a naturalist, a methodological naturalist. There is no legitimate transition to the so-called ontological or metaphysical naturalism, as it was clearly showed in detail in the previous talk in this series by Professor Timothy Williamson a couple of weeks ago. What is interesting and perhaps a bit paradoxical is that while the treatment of natural sciences as disciplines of a broadly understood theology doesn't change science, it makes a change to theology. Science theoretically have no bearing on what was revealed. They do not tell us of the meaning of life, of what task God gave us. In practice, however, they are important to our understanding of certain aspects of revelation. If we are to follow the teachings of Revelation as regards how to act, we need knowledge in terms of psychology and biology, for instance, about the mechanisms which we, as biological organisms, rely on for our behavior. What our animal tendencies are and what is likely to cause uh, us special difficulties. And to this extent, Theology should be interested in studying the actual biological, cultural, and social determinants of man's existence so that he could make the most of the favoring circumstances while guarding against those circumstances which conspire against him. Theology asks these questions of science, and if it wants to be rational, it should respect the answers, whatever they might be. The relation holds in one direction. Science says how things are. Theology takes it on board and tries to work out how to use it to aid in the understanding of revelation. Telling science what theology would like to hear is devoid of purpose. There are no good or bad answers. Any attempt to negate and shut out such knowledge is not only ineffective, but positively harmful. As Ernan McMullin would say, when an apparent conflict arises between a strongly supported scientific theory and some item of Christian doctrine, it may well be that the scientific understanding will enable the doctrine to be reformulated in a more adequate way. And thus we have the figure of fides querens intellectum. And let me finish with the last quotation. It would be foolish to strive for a completely imageless piety in blatant contradiction of human nature. 
However, precisely this consideration makes it all the more important to evaluate images in terms of their true measure and to prevent them from shooting off into the realms of mythology. It is from Cardinal, but not Newman this time, but Ratzinger, former Pope Benedict XVI. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
methodological naturalism is that uh, methodological naturalism defines naturalism as something uh, belonging to the method of science. And the method of science by different people is regarded more, more strictly or less strictly involving more or less uh, metaphysical assumptions. But anyway, it is not a thesis, a metaphys metaphysical thesis that there exists only what science can show us. Mm. Yeah. Well, move on. Yeah. 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 Might be time to continue discussions afterwards, of course. R Ryan, did you have a question? Not immediately. Oh, sorry, I thought <laughs> I saw you raising your hand. Oh, no, I was agreeing. <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Well, I'll jump in and I'll ask a question I, I have in that case, which is, so, so you gave a, a series of examples of cases where science and religion might be thought to come into conflict and in each case it turns out that uh, the appearance of a conflict was merely an appearance and, and, yeah. and there's nothing really there. So, I mean, I, I had two questions relating to this really. Uh, the broader question is whether, whether this isn't too easy. So we all know that you can find your way around uh, uh, these uh, cases, but treating religious belief uh, as an objective phenomenon, we surely do think that uh, in a large class of cases, people's religious beliefs uh, involve mm -hmm. empirical predictions about how things are going to be, uh, whether that's uh, the second coming or, or something mm -hmm. more local uh, and closer to the everyday. And so, I suppose someone might reply to your, your, your talk and say, well, look, of course you can do this. Likewise, with any uh, refuted position, you, you can uh, add on ad hoc uh, uh, qualifications to it in order to preserve it for as long as you like, like. But doesn't this just go to show that there was something wrong there in the first place? Well, I think that it, you're definitely right that many people think that uh, their religious or anti-religious beliefs have uh, empirical consequences and that they can be tested. Uh, my objective was to show on examples that uh, they are wrong. Not you are wrong, you are right that there are many people like that, but they are wrong. In fact, the religion has not empirically testable consequences uh, to my way of thinking. And uh, what we can do is to show uh, that these are only images, that there are only some conceptual frames that clash. And what we can do and what we shall do, encouraged by the former Pope, is to constantly correct those imaginary frames, uh, conceptual frames that we can do. And uh, it is a piecemeal enterprise, I think that we, can, we must approach to every single uh, theory, every single finding of science and uh, laboriously show that in this particular case uh, also we don't find anything clashing with the articles of faith or something like that. So just to push the so point... The, we cannot... Uh, we cannot uh, prove in general, in any general statement, that uh, no uh, scientific outcome can, in uh, principle, be uh, clashing with the faith. What we can do is to proceed from one example to another, and in each case, show that uh, this case is not uh, conflicting with religion. So, so as a follow-up, so I can see I see the idea and the examples you gave, many of them were very compelling. But, so in some cases, uh, the scientific theory allows us to reformulate a doctrine, for instance, yeah. uh, as, as, as you put it. Yeah. But, and, and presumably mm -hmm. there are some cases where we're going to be willing to give up the, the previous form of our, our belief uh, in deference to what natural science has told us. Um, for example, you suggested this might be the case uh, with the Libet experiment and free will. Uh, 
uh, the suggestion, if I understood it, was that it turns out that true freedom isn't the kind of thing that the Libet experiment purports to refute in, in the first place. No. But what I would want to know in that case is whether there aren't going to be some cases where in order to maintain anything resembling theism or a particular uh, religious doctrine, we, we simply can't or couldn't uh, uh, show that kind of deference to natural science. So if, if you had a, a case where, for instance, some central miracle uh, seemed to be disproved by mm -hmm. carbon dating or something, right? Uh, what would we do in that circumstance? Would, 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 does it get to a stage where one has to dismiss the otherwise apparently legitimate scientific evidence? Uh, or, or is any doctrine in principle revisable in the face of, of natural discovery? Uh, well, there are several points. Uh, first, uh, well, let me start with the last one. Uh, I'm asking me that, uh, what about miracles? Uh, well, miracles can uh, be in some sort of clash with scientific uh, scientific position. They're, in a sense, they are obviously in clash in scientific position, as by definition, miracle is something that exceeds the natural uh, course of events. But uh, from the methodological point of view, miracles are uh, quite innocent, and uh, they uh, do not urge us to modify anything in science. Uh, if we believe in Miracles, we believe that something happened that is not predicted or not allowed by science. So what? It doesn't change science. We need not to uh, uh, reformulate science in order to um, embrace miracles as natural phenomena. That, that, was, that would be a difficult task to show that miracles are natural phenomena and find a scientific theory to explain them. We don't need to do that. Science uh, is not required to account for miracles. So some people uh, would say there are, that there is science which describes regularities and there are or there aren't miracles which uh, are except uh, apart from this regularity. And uh, from your earlier point, mm, uh, we are uh, inclined to think that only religion or uh, theology uh, comes with images or conceptual frames that shall be constantly improved uh, with, uh, by the uh, in dialogue with science, uh, but science invokes images too. And uh, for instance, uh, many problems with uh, Libet's uh, findings uh, was were before uh, because a scientific picture was not quite scientific. It was surrounded by some images or conceptions of will. Uh, which were not scientific in themselves. And in this particular case, theology uh, didn't have to adjust to scientific uh, findings. Uh, the Libet findings were exactly along with theological uh, way of thinking. Uh, uh, it was uh, this near scientific image which, should, which needed to be transformed. Thank you. Well, well, in an example of a Libet-like miracle, I was able to detect Ryan's question about a minute before he came up with it. So, um, so I, I do actually have a question now, thanks to um, Ralph's, uh, um, his, his, his question. And it's, it's relating back to the concept of if a miracle itself can provide the basis for, for science to then uh, redesign or, 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 or rethink its framework, as it were. And so then going also back to what uh, the professor over there was saying about um, science is naturally 
um, made up of metaphysical assumptions that need not be derived of theological uh, assumptions. Um, but it doesn't necessarily prove that it doesn't, it's independent either, for it, it's still very much the case that it could very well be. But um, regardless of that, what would you say in the case of when during the natural course of scientific er experimentation, they themselves found themselves indirectly explaining of how a miracle could take place. How would, what would you then it consider can't. that? But, okay, so... Um, if they sorry, can, I, it is not a miracle. Sure, sure, sure. So, okay, so I, think, I suppose then what it is is a rede redefinition of, of, of how we see a miracle. Um, I, and, and the only example that came into my head was obviously um, the findings of the Copenhagen interpretation where they were able to... To, to discern that two particles, it's very possible to, to um, for abnormal movements of particles happen in that way, which sort of lends itself credence to the idea of a miracle, which probably it will then be on, the onus will be on the theologians to reassess exactly what, it, what they mean by, uh, by a miracle. But they seem to be pretty content that it's something that is done by God, at God's will. So then I suppose the onus will be on the science to then redefine to redefine how they would interpret a miracle, <coughs> surely. I think you're right. Uh, I'm not very fond of theologians who use Copenhagen interpretation mm. to uh, explain uh, miracles. Uh, uh, I think that miracle uh, <coughs> shall be completely detached from anything that science can uh, account for. Uh, of course, miracles can be uh, quite regular events, but uh, what makes them miracles is uh, the problem of uh, uh, who uh, made them come about. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Uh, of course, rain on the desert is a, can be a miracle, and it is a natural phenomenon, but if someone says, let the rain come down, and the rain comes. So, uh, I think that uh, there is no need in uh, any uh, sort of theology to uh, find in science such uh, peculiar places as Copenhagen interpretation that there is in the determination and we can find a place for a miracle. Uh, we don't need any places in miracle. Science can be impregnated from miracles uh, and they can happen anyway. And scientists uh, cannot and need not to account for them. They shall just ignore them. Sure. Miracles are uh, singular events. They, uh, there is no regularity in miracles. We, can know, we cannot uh, find any sort of law governing miracles. So it is just, <coughs> we cannot have the Ceteris uh, Paribus clause mm. for miracles. So this is utterly unscientific. Thing. Okay. Thank you. Well, I, we have uh, one question. We'll do one question here and then one from Warsaw. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting and stimulating talk. Uh, actually, I have several questions, and I guess I will have to use my free will to make a <laughs> choice between <laughs> them <laughs> because we have limited well, time here. Blind impulses. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I'll, I'll stick with uh, this choice. I would like to mm, follow up a little bit on the first question which related to the issue of regularity and theism. Mm -hmm. And uh, indeed it looks like uh, the hypothesis of theism is somehow, somehow suggests uh, or somehow, in, uh, somehow uh, strengthens or supports the, uh, the, um, the conviction, the belief that there is some sort of regularity in the world. But I would like to point out that actually this is only possible if we make some additional assumption about the nature of God, uh, which so I mean in principle and to allow me to be a little bit uh, maybe sacrilegious, suppose that God is just a, a completely kind of like a crazy individual, a individual person. that cannot be not benevolent but rather malevolent or. I mean, I mean, it's perfectly, you know, uh, uh, possible to imagine a, a being, a, a powerful being of that sort that actually plays games with us and, and makes events completely random and unpredictable and all sorts of things. So obviously, in order to prevent this, in order to exclude this possibility, we have to make certain additional assumptions about the nature of God and the relation between God and nature. 
And I think, and, and the world, the, the physical world. So, and I think that this teaches us like a more general lesson that in order to talk about any possibility of empirical testing, verification, falsification, uh, confirmation, corroboration of any theistic hypothesis, we have to add a lot of additional auxiliary assumptions mm -hmm. as they are called in philosophy of science. And the main problem as I see it is that these assumptions are very often as dubious as possible. I mean, they, they, they are themselves create so many problems that actually they, they, they themselves kind of require some further justification which we actually lack. So that's probably one of the reasons why we have so many problems, why we have so, 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 such big difficulties with actually uh, putting theism to experimental tests. Yes, that's exactly my point. Uh, I can't see any possibility of empirically testing theism. Uh, and no straightforward connection between the idea of regularity and the idea of uh, God. So uh, that's, I think, your point. And my point that uh, theism and the regularities in science are uh, completely different things. Yeah, but I think it even extends I, to other cases. It's not only about regularity, it's about anything. Anything we would like to, anything that life has purpose, for instance, or that there is some, some well, yeah, of course, there's some connection between regularity and life having purpose, but... No any, natural fact can corroborate or falsify the thesis of theism. A single sort of yeah. hypothesis that God yeah. exists. I mean, yeah. we need some auxiliary assumptions, and these auxiliary yes, assumptions, exactly. in this case, unfortunately, will be of this sort that they're extremely difficult to independently um, somehow justify them. It will exactly. be extremely difficult, so, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, this isn't actually a question from Warsaw, it's just a question from a man from Warsaw, me, namely. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, I wanted to, uh, well, dig a little deeper into the relation between uh, freedom and regularity. Um, and uh, it, it you said that the uh, concept of freedom that was uh, uh, deployed or relied on in the Libet experiment was uh, sort of inadequate. Uh, uh, so my, my suspicion is that it's inadequate because uh, it looks for freedom uh, uh, outside, it, it, that freedom has to be something that contradicts uh, regularity, that it's something that uh, must rely on, on randomness. If we can't have uh, an event that does not follow uh, uh, a certain uh, pattern that can be empirically uh, found by science, then, then it's not free. And you've got these enlightenment ideas of the causally closed universe, um, which, in which you have no freedom, no freedom at all. And so in the 20th century, you have people looking for freedom in, in, in quantum, uh, uh, quantum relativity and, 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 and things like that. But uh, uh, I, isn't it the case that we can only have freedom, uh, we can only have uh, uh, randomness mm -hmm. if we have freedom before? I mean, uh, uh, if you want to uh, select, for example, an object at random uh, from, a, from a bag of objects, I mean, the best, the best thing to do is, of course, to turn your eyes away mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, suspend your free will to choose an object freely and just... And just Move your move your hand um, and and grab the first object that your fingers touch. That seems to be much more random than uh, 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 the selection of, for example, balls in the lottery draw. Which, uh, if you if you uh, uh, believe in causal closure of of the physical, uh, then that. Uh, having the appropriate data could be could be calculated. What you can't calculate is suspending uh, will. Uh, in order to choose an object. So, I mean, if, if, if uh, human beings can, in a sense, insert randomness uh, into the universe by suspending the possibility to make an informed choice, uh, as far as the existence of free will in the universe, uh, and let, I wanted to uh, uh, make a leap mm -hmm. into uh, a related question uh, which you, which you uh, uh, outlined uh, 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 let me get this together. Uh, uh, the related question being the question of whether God is omnipotent if there's randomness. Doesn't randomness contradict God's omnipotence uh, to have to have a universe uh, uh, which is which is fully fully created? Well, 
Uh, part of God's omnipotence would be to allow for free will in a similar way, perhaps, as human beings can uh, mm -hmm. randomly choose an object by suspending their uh, ability to okay. choose or their conviction okay, to that, choose. That, I, sorry for this. I, was, mm -hmm. I thought I had a precise question in <laughs> mind, but when I started going into this, it sort of just sprawled into a, 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 a lots of remarks. We have, uh, have tackled two issues, uh, the question of relation uh, between uh, randomness and uh, free will and randomness and existence of God. Mm. Uh, let us consider the first one. Uh, you have presented uh, a brief, uh, briefly the image of freedom that is very popular and it is initially plausible, uh, but Libet's findings show that it is inadequate. Mm. And when we have several pieces and we are trying to pick one of them, we are not choosing, uh, we are not using our free will in this choice. It is something random in our heads, some, some piece might be a, a little bit bigger or smaller or uh, more red or less red or something like this. Or, uh, some, some fluctuations in our head decide uh, for us uh, what we can do to uh, fulfill our free will is to make prior decision. We can, before entering the room, we can say, I will pick the first, first left from the row. Okay, and that is, and if I came in, I take the first left from the row whatever it is. So this is mm. uh, free will, in fact. And, uh, there are different pictures. You have presented this initially plausible but inadequate picture of what is free will. And the problem of randomness and uh, God. This, this, uh, this picture of free will is indeed of uh, enlightenment origin, 18th century. Uh, uh, when the world was uh, depicted as sort of a mechanism. Uh, now we know that the world is, isn't a mechanism uh, and that there are many random processes uh, in natural world and that we may fall victim of this randomness in our head. So it can uh, influence our decision or um, what we are doing. Uh, our feelings. Uh, randomness according uh, related to God, I, I can't uh, see any sort of clash here. Why uh, shouldn't be randomness if there is God? I can't see mm. that. Uh, of course, God can uh, allow for randomness in this world because God is, it is uh, randomness, it is from our perspective, from the will within world, it is randomness. God is transcendental to the world, not only to the earth, as uh, people uh, perhaps thought some centuries ago, but uh, the whole universe uh, is something which God is behind it or something mm. like that. God is external to the whole universe, to the uh, causal order to anything here and to the time and space. So we cannot say that something that is random for us, so it means it, it has no uh, detectable uh, cause in our causal system, that it is random for God. The notion of randomness uh, has no meaning uh, according to God, I think. Mm. Thank you. Uh, now there are two questions from Warsaw. Uh, one from Professor Oshinska, uh, very short but opening up a huge area of interest. Okay. I'll just read it out. Um, could you please comment uh, about uh, on apathetic faith? Is the theory of evolution? Does the theory of evolution prevent us from believing in an apathetic way? Uh, is Professor Oshinska's question? Well, 
Could Professor Rasinska be a little bit more specific? <laughs> Excellent. Uh, so this, I'll, I'll leave it up to Przemek to, to make okay. the question more specific, uh, mm -hmm. and I'll read out Przemek's question in the meantime, which is, um, your remarks on the notion of free will seem to be a bit unclear to me. For the sake of clarity, could you point uh, to some of the similarities between your point of view and some traditional conceptions like the Spinozian or Hegelian? Um, which both referred to the awareness of human limitations, or Kantian-based conceptions uh, of the a priori respect uh, of moral law, uh, and as such put the so sole intention over the concrete action, and this way seem to escape uh, any form, does, does that seem to escape any form of de determinism? Uh, and the last part, do you think that the category of the hiatus can serve as a basis for a possibility of scientific explanation of free will or human freedom? Well, I, <laughs> I think that I cannot refer to specific uh, historical doctrines and uh, compare it with what I have been talking about here uh, because uh, my main objective was to relate uh, some notions to the contemporary scientific discussions and I don't feel competent to discuss Hegelian, for instance, mm -hmm. Spinozian ideas in a very short. Perhaps I uh, could in some further consideration, but I need some time to uh, learn more about their stance. Well, we are drawing to a close of our, our question time, so I think there will be an opportunity for discussion uh, uh, here afterwards. Unfortunately, that doesn't include uh, our colleagues in Warsaw, unless Mikwai is able to communicate questions to us via the laptop, even during the, the reception afterwards. Um, but for now, we will bring the discussion to a close. Uh, there is, of course, uh, plenty more wine and nibbles. Please do hang around for, the while, for a while if you would like to, but first please give our, our speaker one more thank you. Before.